All right, hello once again, Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. And as part of the Rankin Technical College Application and Website Development, or AWD 1111 Database Driven Web Development Course, I've been doing a series of video presentations, most of which have been based off of Mr. Flavio Cope's Valley of Code uh, website, where he's got a bunch of handbooks. So, so far I've gone through his HTML handbook, his CSS handbook, his JavaScript handbook. Then I took a detour and, and went back and included some of the material that I had made earlier from the AWD 1000 Web Development Technologies class, some JavaScript fundamentals, and I also did some videos based on Brad Traversy's Web Dev Guide. But now I'm back into Mr. Copes again, and now I'm on the server side and I'm going through his Node.js handbook. And I'm 141 pages in, which means that I've got about 20 pages to go. This is going to be either one or two more videos. All right, so the next thing that's in here talks about streams. And as you probably guess, he starts out with what are streams? And he says they're a fundamental concept that powers Node.js applications. They're a way of handling reading, writing files, network communications, or any kind of information exchange in an efficient way. This is a key concept. Streams are not a unique concept to Node.js. They were introduced years ago in Unix, all right, and programs were able to interact with one another by using the pipe operator, okay? Using streams, as it says, all right, we can do things piece by piece, processing content, keeping it all in memory. Well, the Node.js stream module, as mentioned right here, provides the foundation upon which all streaming APIs are built. All streams are, are instances of the event emitter. Now, before we look at the Y streams, just so you see this, if I go back out and I jump over to here to the Node documentation, you'll notice that there is a thing that says stream. And again, it's quite extensive. All right. So they say a stream is an abstract interface for working with streaming data in Node.js. The stream module provides an API for implementing the stream interface. There are many types of stream objects provided by Node.js, and they give examples of some of them. All right. And here are all the different methods that are available. All right. So, as it says here, streams basically provide two major advantages over using data handling methods. First, memory efficiency. You don't have to load large amounts of data into memory before you can process it. Second, time efficiency. It takes less time to start processing data because you can start processing it as soon as you have it rather than waiting until all of the data has been loaded. Here is a stream example. It says a typical example is reading files from a disk. Using the node.js FS or file system module that we talked about earlier, you can read a file and serve it over the hypertext transfer protocol when a new connection is established to your server. And they show it here and they see a read file reads the full contents of the file and invokes the callback function here basically when it's done. The end in the callback will return the file contents to the HTTP client. If the file is big, as mentioned here, the operation will take quite a bit of time. So here is the same thing written using streams. Rather than waiting until the file is fully read, you can start streaming it to the client as soon as you've got a chunk ready to be done. All right. All right. I've got to take a break just for a second here. All right, having a little trouble with my machine, but uh, hopefully it's been rectified. So as it says, the above example uses the line stream.pipe. The pipe method is called on the file stream. What does this code do? It takes the store source and pipes it, or basically not, not so much reallocates it, but it moves it into its right destination. You call it on the source stream. So in this case, the file stream is piped to your HTTP response. One of the things that Linux is, Unix is known for 
is basically taking the output of something and using it or making it the input into something else. It's kind of what we're doing here. Due to their advantages, many Node.js core modules provide native stream capabilities, most notably. I'm not going to read one of these to you, but you can take a look and you notice that in the middle, there's a couple that work with files. All right, there's an HTTP request one also. There are four classes of streams. Readable, which as it says, it's a stream you can pipe from but not pipe into. Writable, where you can pipe into it, but you can't pipe from it. Duplex, where you can both pipe into it and pipe from it. It's a combination, as it says, of a readable stream and a writable stream. And transform, which is similar to duplex, but the output is a transform of its input. All right. How to create a readable stream. As it says, we get the readable stream from the stream module and initialize it and implement it using the read method. I don't want to go through these right now. All right. The writable is similar, except you're using a writable. How do you get data from a readable stream? Using a writable stream. How do you send data to a writable stream? You use the stream's write method. How to signal to a writable stream that you're done writing? You use the end method. How to create a transform stream. As it says, we get the transform stream from the stream module, and we initialize it and implement it using the transform method. Oops, sorry. All right, again, I apologize for that. The doorbell rang. So let's finish up this particular topic. Know the difference between development and production virtually everything that you do when you are creating your node application you're doing in development mode that is until you decide you want to take your node application and upload it to the internet to make it available for others then you go into production mode so as it says it is possible for you to have different configurations for production and development environments. Node assumes you're always running in a development environment. You can signal to Node that you are now in production by setting this environment variable, Node ENV equal production. Now, this is an example of something that you could end up putting into your .env file. All right, it says you, this is usually done by executing that command in the shell, but it's better to put it in um, your shell configuration file because otherwise the setting does not persist in the case of a system restart. You can also apply, imp, apply the environment variable by prepending it to your application initialization itself right there. This environment variable, as it says, is a convention that is widely used in external libraries as well. Setting the environment to production generally ensures that, first, logging is kept to a minimum, and second, more caching levels take place to optimize performance. Now, I'm not going to go through the example because we're not talking pug right here. Don't worry what pug is. They do say, though, that you can use conditional statements so that if I was in development mode, I'd do this. If I was in production mode, I would do this, etc. <laughs> <clears throat> errors in node.js are handled through exceptions again if we take the time to go back here as we've been doing we just went back and looked at stream and if we go back here again you'll notice that there is errors and again you can see how extensive this is why because there's errors that can literally happen with almost anything that you're going to be doing in your node program all right so an exception is created using the throw keyword so you can throw an exception all right as soon as javascript executes this line the normal program flow is halted 
and control is held back to the nearest exception handler. So in other words, when you throw this, the system attempts to handle it, and it attempts to handle it the way you tell it to be handled. All right. Usually in client-side code, value can be any JavaScript value, including a string, a number, or an object. In Node.js, we don't throw strings. We throw error objects. An error object, as it says right there, is an object that is either an instance of the error object or extends the error object. All right. What is the difference? Well, in my humble opinion, at least, if it's an instance of the error object, it's a built-in type of error. And if you're extending it, all right, you are adding something that isn't a typical built-in error like this. I don't think there'd be an error like this. An exception handler is put inside of a try-catch statement. You've seen this kind of thing before. Any exception raised in the lines of code included in the try block is handled in the corresponding catch block. You can add multiple catch handlers, all right, to catch different kinds of errors. And as we have talked about in other languages in earlier classes, you want to put your more um, general errors should be listed at the end and your more specific error should be first. If an uncaught exception gets thrown during program execution, the program will, will crash. To solve this, you can listen for the uncaught exception event on the process object. It says you don't need to import this, it's automatically injected. You can use promises and as it says, using promises, you can chain different operations and handle errors at the end. So what this is saying in this example that you see here on the bottom of this page is you try, you call this routine called do something. All right. And then first, <clears throat> if that succeeds, basically, you call do something two. If that succeeds, you call do something three. If there is an error anywhere along the line, you will just console the error out. How do you know where the error occurred? It says you don't really know, but you can handle errors in each function you call if you want. So in other words, as they show in here, you can do a try-catch try anywhere. All right. To be able to handle errors locally without handling them in the function, you can break the chain. Typically, as it says there, when you just throw the error, you are breaking the chain and to my knowledge, just about always, if not always, the program will just end right there. Now think about why you might want to do something like that. All right. As an example, if I am, uh, if I come in and I've got a database operation and I try to open the database and it doesn't exist or I give it the wrong name or the wrong path, typically I'm dead in the water. So I'd want to stop. All right. Using async await, you can you still need to catch errors and you do it as shown there. Again, within the try catch block. All right, so let me check my time here. I am at 13. I'm just going to finish because I've got about six pages left. They kind of end this particular uh, handbook the way they started it. And that is they're going through here with this sample HTTP web server. Now, how has this changed? Well, I showed you this earlier, but I do want to mention this. This, this says just to add the HTTP built-in module. We've talked about that ad nauseum, as my friend Doug would say. This says we're creating a constant called port. And what we want you to use is if there has been a port set up. So, for instance, if I was running this using Heroku, use that. Otherwise use port 3000. Again, I'm not using 3000 because that's the one, as you're going to see shortly, that's typically going to be used for, for React. Okay. All right. So we come in here and we are creating the server. All right. If it succeeds, we are setting back a response code of 200, which means everything's hunky-dory. In our header, we are setting the content type to HTML. 
so that we can add HTML. And as we end, we're just saying, hello world. And we are telling the server to listen on whatever port we, we gave it. So it says, let's analyze this briefly. Well, I just gave it to you. We'll, we'll go over all of it shortly. But there's nothing right in there that we've just looked at that's really new. So we include the HTTP module, which is used to create the server. The server, as it says, is set to listen on a specified port. I've been using 4,000 rather than 3,000. There is nothing wrong with using 3,000. All right, what they're doing there is not erroneous. It's just not the way I choose to do it. When the server is ready, the listen callback is called. Callback function is called. The callback function we pass is the one that's going to be executed upon every request that comes in. Whenever a new request is received, the request object is called and provides both the request and response object. <clears throat> request provides the request details. Response is used to populate the data that we're going to return. So that's RES. So we return the status code of 200 to indicate a successful response. We respond by setting the header content type to HTML. And we end, close the response with an end statement by just adding that. Nothing new right there. So let's add a little bit more to it with where we are right here as we finish this up. There are many ways to perform an HTTP GET request in Node.js, depending on the abstraction level you want to use. The simplest way to perform an HTTP request using Node.js is to use Axios. Now, I totally agree with what the author is saying right there, with, with what Copes is saying. You will still see on more than one occasion, if you look through enough of this code, people will use fetch, all right, in a, you know, as opposed to using Axios, but Axios is typically easier. So we bring in, what are we doing? Well, if we look here, and I, what I'm going to do is, if I look here, what you'll notice, there is nothing here that says Axios. What does that mean? It means it's not part of what's built into Node. What does that mean? You already know this. That means we should go to npmjs.org, and we can search in here for Axios. And there it is. And you'll notice again, notice 31 million plus weekly downloads. Again, that's a good thing. That means it's being used often. That means it should be stable. All right. And if we look here, promise-based HTTP client for the browser in Node.js, that doesn't say much. They do show in here how we install it, npm i axios. But as always, there is both a GitHub um uh, repository and there's a github homepage. so if we bring up the home page axios is a simple promise-based http client for the browser and node.js axios provides a simple way to use a simple to use library in a small package with a very extensible interface all right and they even show how it can be used in here all right so we could go through this and do the get started and walk through this, etc. I'm not going to do this right now. Or you can go the other way, where you can go to view on GitHub, look at this, and then after this, there should be some additional documentation. I think personally, this is the way to go. All right? Because you can see, and you can see how long this thing is. There's a lot of documentation. As you are learning this, this is a great resource. And I've said this kind of thing to you before. I'm saying it again. And what I'm saying to you is don't worry about memorizing this kind of stuff, but know where to go to find out how to use it. Once you've created a sample or two of this, it should be much clearer to you as far as what you're doing, or hopefully it will be. Axios requires the use of a third-party library. All right, what does that mean? Again, it's in, it's in the Node Package Manager. A GET request is possible just using the standard modules, although it's more verbose. You can see the information that you've got to give it. 
There's nothing wrong with doing this. It's more code. Probably it's going to end up taking more time. All right. Similar to making an HTTP, key, HTTP get request, you can use Axios to perform a post request. All right. Or alternatively, again, you can do it using the standard modules. But again, that will result in more code. What, I'm, what you're getting here real quickly are the CRUD operations. CRUD, C for create. All right, and that's pretty much what you're doing with the post. R for read, that's what you're pretty much doing with the get. Put and delete. Put is basically the update. And as it says, put and delete requests use the same post format. All right. Get HTTP request body data. Here is how you can extract data that was sent as JSON in the request body. We are going to be going through some examples of this. So as you read through it, if it doesn't make a boatload of sense now, all right, hopefully it will in a bit. All right, it says here, if you're not using Express, and you want to do this in vanilla node.js, you need to do a bit more work. Because Express, being a framework, it abstracts a lot of this for you. So it does it behind the scenes. All right? As it says right here, the key thing to understand is when you initialize the HTTP server using create server, the callback is called when the server got all the HTTP headers but not the request body. The request object passed is a stream, so we must listen for the body content to be processed. It's processed in chunks, chunks rather. We first get the data by listening to the stream data events. When that ends, the end event is called once. So to access the data, assuming we expect to receive a string, we must concatenate the chunks into a string. So in other words, it's coming in in pieces. We must put the pieces together and then parse the string to JSON so it'll be understood. So starting from the Node.js v10, a for, wait, and of syntax is available, which can make this a little sim more simplistic to use. Now, that's it. All right, so I have now completed the Flavio Copes Valley of Code HTML handbook, the Flavio Copes Valley of Code CSS handbook, the Valley of Code Flavio Copes JavaScript handbook, and now the Flavio Copes Valley of Code Node.js handbook. When I come back, I am going to go over his Express handbook. I'm going to do that fairly quickly, hopefully. This is old. This one that's in here is in the process of being redone. So there may be some things in this. And it's not real long. It's 46 pages. There are things in this that when he upgrades and updates this, and hopefully it'll be out soon, all right, if there's any changes, those changes will be made. After we get done with that, we're going to go over his React handbook. Again, 31 pages. So it's going down in size, all right? So we started with a book that was 74 pages. We went to one that was 175 then 56, then 161, but now we're going down to, whoops, we're going down to 46, then 31. When I get done and get to those points, I want to mention a couple of the textbooks from Goal Kicker, and then we're going to get in, we're going to start writing some code, promise. All right, so I will be back with the Valley of Code Express Handbook,
All right, I'll be back with that in just a couple minutes.